Hello, my name is Bill Gralnick. I'm a volunteer interviewer for the Boca Raton Historical Society and Museum. The museum is conducting a series of interviews to document the development and growth of Boca Raton's Jewish community. Today is May 3rd, 2017. I'm in the television studio of Lynn University with Shirley Solomon. Shirley, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Shirley Solomon, and I came to Boca Raton in 1986. Well, with just that sentence, we can tell that that accent is neither uh, Florida or New York. Um, tell us where you were born and when you got here. I'm kind of an interesting case. Uh, I grew up in the Delta of Mississippi. We're in a traditional home, kosher home, with uh, my grandmother and my parents and cousins all around. And um, we, we brought all our meat from Memphis and so forth, and I lived there until I went to college when I was 18 years old. And where did you go to college? Smith College. And uh, when did you come uh, to Boca again? I came in 1986, but um, I was in college until 1960. Uh, well, actually, 1959, when I met my husband, who was, I was in Boston for the summer, and he was uh, going to be a senior in law school the next year, and I was going to be a senior in college. And we married in 1960, took master's in 61, and then moved to Louisville, Kentucky. As often happens in an interview, uh, the interviewer sometimes Ask, answers a question before it's asked. One of the things that uh, I was going to ask you a little bit further down um, the interview was um, where did this impulse to get involved in Jewish life and be so committed come from? So you're telling us that you grew up um, almost in a, in a time capsule uh, in in Mississippi, what was uh... I had a grandmother who used to say, "You will grow up Jewish, you will marry Jewish, and you will bring up Jewish children." And uh, she's sort of a role model for me. But um, my real um, action call came when I was a young mother in Louisville, Kentucky with four young children. And the time came to choose, do they go to Hebrew school or do they not? Because they had three girls first and then the boy. And um, I'm living in a mixed neighborhood and I'm saying to myself, what will keep my children Jewish? So the choice then became an easy one. Um, but speaking of easy, was it easy once they started becoming identifiably Jewish? How did the community accept you? Oi. Uh, no, the community accepted. I mean, Louisville is sort of, you know, it's not like, they're not like these massive prejudices or mm -hmm. whatever. But um, being Jewish, is you have to convince the children themselves that it's a great thing. And so we began with Hebrew school with, uh, oh, by the way, every one of my children went to Israel as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we went as a family in 1977. Uh, that was actually my husband and my first trip to Israel. And it's just continually associating them with, quote, the joys of being Jewish. Let's jump uh, a little bit and get you here to Boca Raton. Um, you're known for your committed involvement in Jewish life as a volunteer and a philanthropist. Um, what was the, Jew the first Jewish organization that you became involved with? Well, unbelievably, it was the JCC here. It, 
it was the JCC here in Boca. But I had been involved for 20 years in the Louisville JCC. And um, I eventually went to the JCC board and then to the Donna Klein board. And I eventually became president of the board of Donna Klein. And for me, that was a huge challenge. Uh, what year was that? Do you remember? Uh, Ruff roughly? I think... Uh, we moved on the campus in 92, and I took a fourth year because I wanted to successfully move Donna Klein from Spanish River to uh, the campus. And so that's when it was, 88 to 92. It would be helpful um, if you could give us a description of Donna Klein pre-campus and post-campus. Well, it really wasn't pre-campus and post-campus. It was when... I came to the board. Donna Klein was kind of a dumping ground for whatever problem there was in, you know, in a Jewish family and if they had the funds and the whole thing. And we actually subsidized a lot who didn't. But we decided, we made a conscious decision that if Donna Klein was going to survive, we were going to have to. Uh, raise the standards and um, and build an, a really important school. And so we, the campus was like this huge incentive. We had this beautiful building and whatever. And so between we moved to the campus with like 75 students and then and then we eventually, the next year we had 175 and the growth was legendary. But also, the person who was running the school wasn't doing as good a job as I thought he should. So I became a member of the Jewish Education Service of North America board. And at one of their meetings, I met one of my favorite people in Boca, or, or in the general area, Leon Weisberg. And I liked his sense of humor. I liked his approach to Jewish education. And so when I got the chance, my husband, who was luckily president of Federation at that time, we brought him to Boca to be the, um, he never liked the name headmaster, but to be the, the professional leader of Donna Klein. Now, um, before we co go further with uh, Dr. Weisberg, just give us a, um, a quick look at the physical plant of the first Donna Klein compared to the physical plant of the second Don Donna well, Klein. Well, you have to, from my perspective, because I moved from Louisville, Kentucky, looked to me like a motel. I'd never seen uh, you went inside, outside, whatever. Later I found out there are a lot of Florida schools built that way. But uh, we moved to this beautiful new Siemens campus in 1992, and people couldn't wait to put their children, to give them the best break they could. Um, Dr. Weisberg uh, has come up and will continue to come up in many of uh, these interviews because he's had such uh, across-the-board positive impact on, um, on Jewish life in this community. But you mentioned that you transferred, if you will, uh, not your allegiance, but, but a lot of your energy from the JCC to education. And you mentioned uh, an organization called JESNA. Tell us a little bit about what JESNA is and what it does. Well, now JESNA is defunct. JESNA was uh, the advocate for Jewish education on the national level. It was the Jewish Education Service of North America. It was the professional was Jonathan Wucher, who is, is famous. He's now with the Lippmann Camphor Institute. And um, it was, uh, going on the board was really exciting. And the way I went on the board 
was uh, we had kind of a regional meeting and they had a board meeting and I or maybe it was even at the GA but I went in there and I said I'm very interested in this can I stay and I don't know if anybody remembered Al Golden but from Miami but he was a member of the Jasna board and they threw me out at that time. They said, you're not a board member, you can't stay or whatever. Within the next six months, I was on the board. Now, what was it about Jewish education that really lit you up? What were the things that you wanted to see implanted? You had mentioned you didn't think um, a director at that time before Leon was doing as good a job. What did you want to see impressed on the uh, education. I, I want, and again, I'm back to the joys of being Jewish, that I have been involved in all sorts of Jewish education that is formal and informal, Jewish camping, Jewish, whatever uh, appeals because you will not engage children, teenagers, preteens, whatever, without being interesting to them without um, them being excited and reaching and loving what they're doing. And so that's what I wanted the Jewish piece of their lives to become important to them. Now there has been, um, particularly in, in the day school movement, uh, a constant tension between what Jackie Mason would call too Jewish um, and not Jewish enough. Um, and we went through that here. What kind of, of Jewish community school did you think would be right for uh, Boca Raton? And what were the things that you did to move it in that direction? Uh, well, I identified myself with a community school. We can't have segments of the population looking down, of the Jewish population, looking down at other segments of the Jewish community. We have to have um, opportunity for the, cho for the students to push themselves as far as they want to go. We have to have quality education available to them. Um, we have to avail ourselves of the incredible Jewish scholars that we have grown over the years, such as Arnie Eyes and Jonathan Rucher, uh, and many, many others. And how does one go about getting those people to turn their attention to Boca Raton, Florida? It's easy now. There are 120,000 of us, 130,000 of us. We're hot stuff. But in those days, um, I would say we had, uh, well, Miami was close. And, and it, we were part of the Gold Coast in a way. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had a very interesting history because Boca Raton was not very Jewish up until the 70s. And then the community opened up. And then there was this huge migration. My husband often says it's the largest voluntary Jewish migration in the history of the Jews. Um, we became um, a community to be dealt with, to, to encourage, to look for leadership. And um, for example, Right now, coming home tomorrow, is the March of the Living. We had six buses this year. We started out as part of the Miami March of the Living with 20 kids. And, and uh, we've grown since the first March was in 1988. And it's made terrific, that particular program has made terrific impact. And Leon Weisberg, of course, who was, who 
was born in a in a uh, displaced persons camp has been a huge force and there was this huge group out of Miami who encouraged it it's it's really an exciting um thing that South Florida has given to the Jewish community. Now you've spoken to many of the children who have, um, young men and women who have come back from the March of the Living. What, um, what sense do you get from them that the experience has had on them? When they get off the bus, they are totally dedicated. They are going to live their lives as uh, and I don't want to say observant, I want to say participatory Jews. But nothing grows without being watered. And so that is not, that is when they are 16 or 17 years old. And then we have to have college programs and we have to have such as Hillel and, and um, even fraternity and sorority life, we have to have all the programs. And what's going on now is, um, I think there's a, I think we're going to get, I've heard rumors and I haven't heard specifics, we're gonna get Moshe House in this community. Hmm. And has anybody talked to, talked about what Moshe House is? No. Moshe House is a, um, house in a community where young Jewish singles live and have Jewish programming and rituals and other Jewish singles in the community participate. That's, that's very exciting. And it's gone global and it's, it's amazing. It's all over the world now. It started about, I don't know, eight or nine, 10, 12, I don't know how many years ago. Now, um, you also mentioned Jewish camping, which statistics tell us have a, um, has huge. a huge impact on, on Jewish identity. Um, what energies have you given there? Um, I have really done more through JCC and JCCA. Uh, JCCA has a resident camping uh, program and uh, we have several camps all over the United States, and I am a huge proponent of day camp. Uh, when a child is three years old, it's their first experience learning how to ride the bus, being with people, everything. Every Jewish child should go to JCC day camp. Now, I want to remind the, uh, the viewer that the various things that you have mentioned, you said are all components of Jewish education. Right. Uh, and I think you're making a, a, a very important point that Jewish education is not just in the classroom in a Jewish school, but contact points all throughout the Jewish life of, of uh, our young men and women. Right, absolutely. and. Uh, and through the Jewish home, because the biggest job of the Jewish mother is to hock the kids. <laughs> and, I, uh, and for the uninitiated, did you go uh, to? Did you go to Hillel? Did you? Because one of the big issues is Jewish children leave home and go to college. I think uh, is it still ninety percent, ninety five percent of Jewish children yep. go to college and they get out from under the wing of the family. So questions like, did you go to the Seder? Did you do what you were supposed to do? Uh, did, you, mm -hmm. did you meet with your Jewish friends? Did you meet Jewish friends? Did you join a Jewish sorority? Whatever. But uh, it's our job to, to be sure that the kids continue. Now, before I ask you the next question, I also feel um, an insert is necessary. This person we've been referring to as um, my husband uh, is Alan Solomon, who is a brilliant attorney and a very well-respected leader in his own right of this Jewish community, and I wanted to give him his due. 
Thank um, you. Shirley, when we were talking uh, prior to the interview, you mentioned um, an organization that was new, or at least it was new to me, um, and um, you hocked me to go on the computer and <laughs> look it up, I did. which I did. It's called Project Upstart. Uh, tell us a little about it. It's a fascinating program. Isn't it fascinating? Yes. Um, actually, through my national contacts, through JCCA and and this uh, the the start the the person who started Upstart is uh, a young lady who was the assistant quote bureau director. And I don't know if anybody knows the Jewish Education Commission, the bureau, the whatever, mm -hmm. in San Francisco. And uh, her dream was to um, help the millennials the, or the young Jews who wanted to start new Jewish organizations, who wanted to operate outside of the organized Jewish community as we knew it, or, uh, to, uh, to fulfill the needs that they have. And um, so the organization is basically an incubator, and it teaches young people who want to go into Jewish communal life, who want to become Jewish professionals, how to run a nonprofit. Um. As somebody like myself who just suddenly found himself running a nonprofit and did so for 33 years, that kind of program would have been of immeasurable help to me. Well, part of the program is how to build a board, how to approach prospective board members. Um, actually, one of the young people that I have meant toward, as I told you before, is a young man from Chicago who has an organization, who started an organization called Kahal. And his organization uh, connects Jewish uh, students abroad with the Jewish resources in the community. And he's working out of Chicago. Now, I have a daughter in Chicago. You should have, um, it was actually science to see him approach her to become one of his board members. I loved, loved the whole process. Well, speaking about loving the whole process, this has been a wonderful, engaging, uh, as well as informative interview. Is there anything um, maybe of a philosophical nature that you'd like to leave with? Yes, I want to say something because um, as, as, and I hope I can say this, historically we have grown as the Jewish community of 1970 up to uh, 2017, May 3rd, May 5th, 2017. And we're different, and we have to adapt. And the, um, the needs of the, the, say, Jewish children, my grandchildren, the ones that are young adults today, might be different from the ones that, they, that we experienced. And the, we also have the possibilities and opportunities of the internet and the vast array of information that's out there and how to put it to use and so forth, challenges probably. And so the approach, the Jewish community approach going forward must change and should change to accommodate what we're going to do in the future. Words of wisdom. We thank you so much, not only for your service, but for the time of this interview. And uh, 
the derby's and in a couple hanging out <laughs> hanging out uh, the derby's in a couple of days good luck if you bet thank and you. Uh, again thank you so much for doing this it was my pleasure